Well, Vacation Bible School 2023 starts tomorrow. Our theme this year is Twist and Turns, and it's all uh, based on a theme having to do with games. Uh, it can be board games, video games, playground games, any type of game. So I want you to think for a second about a board game. What is your favorite, we would say, your favorite board game of all time? It's your favorite board game of all time. What is it? Chess. Clue. Chess? Clue. Clue? Clue? Monopoly. Monopoly? Monopoly. Monopoly? What else? Checkers. Checkers. Oh. Okay, I can see you back there. LOL Surprise. LOL Surprise? Okay. Okay. Yahtzee. Yahtzee? Okay. Uno. Uno's a good one. Okay. Now, my favorite game of all time is kind of a game that we as a family take really serious. Now, there's some games that we play just for fun, but there's one game in our family that we take very, very serious, and that's Settlers of Catan. We don't mess around when it comes to Settlers of Catan. It is a serious time, particularly when Phoebe plays, okay? Because Phoebe is not nice when she plays games, let's just face it. <laughs> Phoebe either wins or she's a loser. That's all that Phoebe knows. And so my son, sometimes, especially when he's in a game where he's just not playing very well, will purposely not play well. And it drives Phoebe insane. <laughs> because even though she's going to win, she doesn't feel like she's got a satisfying win because she couldn't beat him at his best. And she's angry and she won't talk to us for like 15 minutes. She's that angry. <laughs> My family, uh, my, my, my wife's family, though, they have another game that's very important to them. It's the game Scrabble. Oh, yeah. Now, Scrabble, I've never been much of a Scrabble player. I've never, I've never been very good at spelling. Uh, so it's not been a game that I was real good at. I could you not. I mean, in high school, I actually had a, a note that I was writing to a girl, and my, my best friend took it because that's what best friends do. Uh, they're boys. They took, he took my letter and read it, and then he started laughing, and I was like, why are you laughing? He goes, I don't want to tell you. You'd be embarrassed. I said, just tell me. He goes, well, you spelled stupid wrong. <laughs> never made that mistake again. Okay, the spelling's never been something that I loved. So, so when I heard her tell me that, that my family likes to play Scrabble, I was like, okay, that's fine, I'll, I'll play it with them, whatever. But they were having a family reunion, and as we, we pulled up before the house, she made me stop the car, and she looked at me, and she goes, I hope you love me after this. <laughs> it's like, uh-oh, what am I walking into? She goes, well, I'm just going to warn you, my family is really serious when it comes to Scrabble. And I thought, well, how, how serious can you be about Scrabble? I mean, come on. Then I got into the house and I realized how serious they were. They had individual tables set up. Each table had to have the official Scrabble dictionary on that. And if you have, if you played a word that her grandma did not think was in the official Scrabble dictionary, she'll stab you. <laughs> she doesn't mess around. So luckily for me, I went out in the first round. I was like, yes, I'll go play with the kids. <laughs> They take Scrabble very seriously. If you think you're a good Scrabble player, I challenge you to play against April, you will lose. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not kidding, she's good at Scrabble. Well, you know, games are fun. Games are something that we have great memories of, and that's what we're going to be uh, playing with this year uh, at VBS. But the lessons in the Bible study will specifically focus on the life and ministry of Peter as he was a follower of Christ. So we're going to learn what it is to be a follower of Christ by looking at the example of Peter. The key verse for this week comes from Psalm 25. Psalm 25, verse 4, and it's this. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Listen to that again. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. This morning we're going to look closely at this verse and at verse 5 in order to see the challenge that it lays out, not just to the kids of VBS this week, but also for us just as much. So turn with me in your Bibles, if you haven't already, to Psalm 25. Psalm 25. And as you, as you turn there, I want to kind of set the context, because we're not going to look closely at the entire verse. I'm going, to, I'm going to touch on it just a little bit, but we're going to specifically look at those two verses. But I want us to get an idea of what this psalm is all about. 
This psalm is another one of the psalms of King David. And in this psalm, David is crying out for guidance from God. He wants guidance from God. He's facing an enemy. Now, we don't know what that enemy is. We don't know what point of David's life that he wrote this, or if it's just a culmination of multiple enemies that he faced in his life. We don't know for sure. But what he does recognize in this psalm is that his only hope is the one true God. That that was the only one who was going to give him hope. So look at Psalm uh, 25, and I'm going to go ahead and read it. Uh, but then, like I said, we're, I'll reference some things in it, but then we're going to go ahead and look at, at verses 4 and 5. It says in, in, in Psalm 20, let me actually switch my glasses here because I'm old. Anybody else there? <laughs> Amen or oh me, right? Psalm 25 of David. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love. For they have been from, old, from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right. He teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. He makes known to them his covenant. My eyes are ever towards the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged, bringing me out of my, or bringing me out of my distress. Consider my affliction and my trouble, and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes, and with what violent hatred they hate me. O oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O oh God, out of all his troubles. So again, there's much too much in this passage for us to study uh, in one sitting. So we're just going to touch on some of the important points, the key ideas that we find in here that kind of uh, are all brought together with our key verses here. So one of the big things that we find in talking about here is the idea of shame. He uses the term ashamed multiple times here. And when we think about shamed uh, today, we often think about something that I did or that you did that you're ashamed about that you feel bad about. I shouldn't have done this. I'm ashamed that I did this. I, I'm ashamed to show my face in this context because of something that happened or something that was done. Now, that's not actually the Hebrew understanding of shame here. Okay? Sometimes you find that shame in other parts of the Bible, but here, particularly in the Psalms, that's not the shame that they're typically talking about. Typically, the shame that they're talking about here is to be let down or disappointed. To be let down or disappointed. So it's something that, in the end, would turn out to be unworthy of one's trust. Something that, 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 that was unworthy of someone's trust. Thus, the point that David makes when he talks about being ashamed here is that those who trust in the Lord will never find him unworthy of that trust. Even through the midst of trials and tribulations, we will never find him unworthy of that trust. But this isn't something that happens without any human action in our response to God's, what we call, initiating action. God initiates his faithfulness, he initiates his grace, but he expects a response out of his people. And that's what we see in the psalm. We see that the balance of that. God's faithfulness, God's goodness poured out on his people, but his people also need to respond to him. That's why it talks about God teaching and leading his people. 
God teaching and leading his people. God teaches through his word. He teaches through the Holy Spirit. And he teaches through his people, the church. And he also leads his people. But his people need to be willing to be led. Now, good thing in Israel's history, they were always willing to be led, right? <laughs> Wrong. They weren't. Good thing throughout church history, the church has always been willing to be led, right? Wrong. I like how James Montgomery Boyce wrote it many years ago when he said, It is something that requires responsible learning, obedience, faithfulness, trust, and deep reverence on our part. We have to do something about it. And that fits because it really fits along with our salvation. Think about when we talk about salvation. When we talk about salvation, justification, where God makes us right with Him through the work of Jesus Christ, is solely the work of God. You will never at any point be able to justify yourself or make yourself right before God. You can't do that through good works. You can't do that through being a nice person. At no point will you ever be able to justify yourself before the Holy God. It is only through the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross that we can be justified before God. Amen. So we talk about salvation being a work of God. That's what we mean. That, that only God can justify us before God. Only the Holy God can do that. And He did that through the finished work of Christ for all who believe. That's why we say that salvation is by grace alone through faith alone. Yeah. Nothing else, not our actions or any of that can save us. It's only by grace alone through faith alone. But another part of salvation is what we call sanctification. So we talk about salvation, we talk about justification, sanctification, and glorification. Okay? Theologically, we talk about those three areas when we talk about our, our, our salvation. Sanctification is something that we have a part in. Glorification, we have no part in. Okay? We will be with Him one day in heaven. And we won't do anything about that other than stand at the gates of heaven for like a thousand years going, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Justification is fully a work of God. Sanctification, though, there's a partnership there. God is at work in our life through the work of the Holy Spirit, but we have a responsibility to respond to Him as well. We don't just go on a hill somewhere once we get saved and go, all right, God, grow me. I'll sit here and wait for you. No, God grows us, gives us opportunities to grow, but He expects a response out of us. And unfortunately, some believers get stuck. Because they refuse to obey. They refuse to put themselves in a situation where they can grow. They refuse to do the things that God called them to do. And that's what David is really calling for in this psalm. There's also a pleading in this psalm with God to remember and extend His mercy and steadfast love, but also to forget about the sins of David's youth. How many of us cry out for that? Amen. Yeah. Forget about the sins of my youth, and I need your mercy and your steadfast love. There's also a confession, but the confession is of the faithfulness of God towards his people. Throughout this, we see that, that, that David is continually talking about how faithful God is to his people. God is faithful to his people even when his people are not faithful to him. God's faithfulness endures. There's also a teaching in here on how to live as the friends of God. How to be the friends of God. How to live in a way that you're walking with the Lord. And then finally, a pleading for help under the current trials and tribulations that David is facing. Again, we don't know what they are, but that's the beauty of it, is that that makes them timeless. Because it's not necessarily a specific trial and tribulation, it's all the trials and tribulations. And the reality is, is that David had trials and tribulations, some were foisted on him by other people, some he brought on himself. And guess what? So do we, right? Anybody have any troubles that other people have done to you? Amen or oh me? Anybody have any trials and tribulations that we brought on ourselves? Right? Yeah. 
Reality is, is that that's where we can connect with David. Now David had different trials and tribulations, different struggles, but yet we all have struggles together. So let's look at verses 4 and 5. And, and let me just read them again just so that we're, we're, we're familiar with them uh, and, and it's clear what we're looking at here. Okay, Verses 4 and 5. It says, Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. These verses reflect the heart's desire of those who truly follow the Lord, even in the midst of trials and tribulations. This is where our, what our heart cry should be. This is where, where our mind should be. To have the same cry. To know the pathway that God would have for us, and that God would lead us on that pathway at all times. During the good times, but also during the bad times. That God would show us the path that He has for us, and that He would lead us on that. Part of Him leading us on that pathway, though, is that we have to do something about it, don't we? So in essence, it sets the foundation. This, these verses really set the foundation for the rest of the psalm, <laughs> focusing on how we live our lives pleasing to God. And he lists how we live our lives pleasing to God and receive a blessing. In verse 7, he says that, that, our, that our sins must be forgiven, that our sins would be forgiven. We praise God for that, amen? amen? Verse 9, we find that we have to seek humility in our lives, to seek to be a humble people. Verse 12, we see that we need to uh, revere God, that we need to hold God up as the holy, holy, holy God in all ways. Verse 20, we find our refuge in Him. Verse 21, we see that we need to live an upright life. That's the pathway that He has for us. So David is calling out to, to know that and then to be led on that. So he says, make, to me, uh, make me to know your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Both parts of this verse say, in essence, a very similar thing. And that thing is, is that God would reveal his path to us, his people. We need to know the path of God. You ever been lost? Anybody been lost before? It's no fun, right? A lot of the women out here are going, yes, I've been lost. The men are like, no. <laughs> I knew exactly where I was. Everyone else was lost. <laughs> I went to Hong Kong years ago with, with, with the Northwest Baptist Convention. We brought a whole bunch of youth groups to Hong Kong and went uh, on a mission trip over there. We were over there for two weeks. Uh, one of the weeks, we went to the Baptist World Conference. Uh, and then the next week, we did uh, mission work in Hong Kong. Uh, and, and we were with, during the week of mission work, we were in a school. Uh, and it, Hong Kong is basically a gigantic city that they built up. Okay? So everywhere there's high rises everywhere. Okay? One of the things that I didn't know about Hong Kong going in, though, that for a lot of Europeans, Hong Kong is very similar to Las Vegas for Americans. People go there to do things that you don't want other people to know that you did. I didn't know that going there. <laughs> so when we got there, and we found out that our hotel was right in the middle of the red light district, I was like, great. <laughs> I just glad I didn't make that part of the plan. <laughs> so I wasn't to blame for that one. But I remember uh, on one of the days that we went and we did our mission work, and then we were supposed to meet the bus back at a particular place. And I was like, okay, I remember where it all is, so no problem. So we went and we did our mission work, and it was a busy day of work because we got there. And, and once we said, well, we're going to do kind of a VBS with them, the, the, the leader of the school said, you can't do that. I was like, oh, really? Great. So now I had to come up with an entire new curriculum. So I literally put my teachers in their different classes, and then I went and I wrote the first half hour of curriculum and then ran it up to them and then ran back and wrote the next half hour of curriculum and ran it up to him. So I was pretty exhausted that day, as you can imagine. After the day was over and we started heading back to the bus, I started following the line of smut back to our bus because that's how I thought, that's how I'll remember. There's all these smutty shops and there's all these prostitutes and things like that. I'll just follow that along to where the bus is and we'll be there. The problem is, is the smut was all around us. So I took a group of 25 kids on the wrong way through the red light district in Hong Kong. Not fun. Not good. 
especially when I had kids going, um, Pastor Ben, I think it's the other way. No, 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 I know where we're going. <laughs> I did not know where we were going. Praise God we got there, eventually. It is good to know the path. I thank God for GPS. <laughs> GPS makes me look like I'm an expert finding places. And in reality, I, I just know how to punch it into the GPS to find where I'm going. God's way or path is something that all believers have to prioritize in our life. Knowing the pathway that God has for us and being on that pathway must be the priority of our life. Too many professed Christians today are more concerned with having what I call fire insurance, i.e., I don't want to go to hell when I die, so I guess I believe. <laughs> Instead of recognizing that Jesus came not to just be our Savior, but also to be our Lord. Part of being our Lord is that He gives us the pathway to walk. He tells us the way to go. Building on this, David says this, lead me in your path or in your truth and teach me. Lead me in your truth and teach me. Not only does David want to know the way or the path of God, but he also wants to be led in God's truth throughout his life. It's important to understand something here. If God is leading us, we will be a growing people when it comes to our faith, but also our practice. If God is truly leading you, you will be growing in your faith and your practice of the Word. Not one or the other, but both. You will see it in your life. You'll see the evidence. You'll see the evidence of your faith growing, but you'll also see the practice if God is leading you. But leading is never done passively. Leading is something, you can't lead somebody passively. Either you're leading them or you're not. It's that simple. Therefore, following is not passive either. There's no such thing as a passive follower of Christ. You're either following him or you're not. Because he's on the move. He's doing things. <laughs> Too many want to sit by the sidelines and go, Yay, God, go for it. Woo-hoo! No such thing as a passive follower of Christ. So David's words here really could be seen as a prayer. And they're a dangerous prayer, but they're immensely worthwhile at the same. Lead me. Lead me, God. Teach me. And he says, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. David brings this back to the source of the truth, the source of his hope, the source of, of, of what will bring him out, what, whatever tribulation that he's in. The God of his salvation. Now when he's talking about salvation here, he's talking about being saved from a circumstance. Whatever circumstance he's dealing with, being saved from that particular one. But we understand that he's even more than that, right? He, not, he doesn't just save us out of our circumstances, he saved us out of hell. And that's good news, Amen. By saying he will wait on the Lord, David is saying that he will be patient because he knows that God will ultimately bring salvation to his people. That God will do it. God will do it in his time. Sometimes his timing is difficult, isn't it? But God will do it in his time. So what? Let's talk about how this applies to our life. Two things that I want us to really take home this morning is this. First of all, this passage is a call to personal discipleship. This call is a, it, it, or this passage is a call to personal discipleship. Discipleship is the idea that we're growing and we're following. That we're growing in our walk and we're following. That we're becoming disciples of Christ. That as each day goes by, that we're becoming more and more disciples. And this is where it starts for all of us: personal discipleship. Am I really? Making a, am I really growing in my personal walk as a believer? Am I making it a priority in my life? You can put on a show at church on Sunday morning. Okay? We call it our church faces. We've all done it. We've done it. We've been in ministry for lots of years. April and I have been in ministry together for almost 25 years. Okay? And, and so, and we've had, we have four kids. And believe it or not, I know this might be shocking to some of you, 
But some mornings, our kids were brats. And some mornings, we were overly stressed. And some mornings, we had it out in the car on the way to church. And some mornings, one of the both of us were like, I'm going to kill them! <laughs> oh! <laughs> then we get to church and it's like, oh, a church face is good. <laughs> Praise Jesus, everything's good. <laughs> I think a lot, the reality is that oftentimes we do that. We can put on a show at church. We can put on a show that we're growing in our walk with Jesus. But he knows, and the reality is, is that you know as well. You know as well. How do we do it? How do we grow in our walk with Jesus? Look at the passage. Personal discipleship is all about knowing and following the pathway of God. It's all about knowing and following the pathway of God. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we need to spend time personally reading God's Word. We need to spend time in God's Word. God speaks constantly. And He speaks in His Word. But we're not going to get it because we have the nicest Bible sitting on a shelf. We're going to get it because we're going to spend time reading it. You might say, well, I'm not a good reader. God didn't call you to be a good reader. He didn't say, only good readers can read my word. Read it slow. Focus it on specific areas. If you say, you know what, I'm going to get into my Bible reading... I'm going to pick up the first book that I look at in the Bible, and I'm just going to read it. What is this book Leviticus all about? <laughs> You're going to suddenly find that, wow, that's a hard book. It's a good book, by the way. It's an important book, but it's a hard book. It's certainly a hard book to start with. You know, I can help you. Other people in the church can help you. If you need to get in a personal reading plan, to understand how to best read it, the best books to start in, best books to get into. I always recommend people read the Gospel of Luke. Luke is a very easy book to read. It's very approachable. And you can learn about the most important person to ever walk the face of the earth, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a great book to start in. Philippians, great book to start in. Read it as slow as you need to to be able to get understanding. Some people read through chapters and chapters and chapters of the Bible every day and don't remember a thing that they just read. That's of no value. You're much better off finding one paragraph and reading it over and over and over again until you really understand what's there. And when you don't understand, write down some questions. Find people who can help you answer those questions. Find actual, real, live, living people, not the Internet. <laughs> Just want to put that out there, okay? There's also value in in-depth Bible study. In-depth Bible study. Spending a lot more time digging into it. You find a book that you really like, dig into it more. Get some commentaries, get some other things that will help you to understand some of the background. Do you know another way that will grow in our personal discipleship is by investing time in serving someone else for Christ's sake. That seems weird, because it sounds like personal is just all about me growing in my own way. But the reality is, is that when you serve, you also grow. When you serve side by side with somebody else, God uses that as an opportunity to grow you. Do you want to grow in your personal relationship? Spend time in God's Word, but also spend time serving the Lord. This passage is also a call to corporate discipleship. It's our second point. Passages are called to corporate discipleship. Well, David focuses here on God leading him personally. We're going to see in the last, we see in that last verse there, that there's a corporate leaning to the passage also. He says, he says uh, to save Israel out of her troubles, doesn't he? Discipleship is, that is solely personal will never help us to grow into the mature believers that we need to be. We'll become stunted in our growth every time. Let me use the example of Lydia on her volleyball team. <clears throat> Lydia is, is trying out for the Castle Rock volleyball team, and, and that's, a, that's a big task. Castle Rock takes volleyball really serious. Okay? When we're in Spokane, everything in the Spokane area is about basketball. You play other sports just to stay in shape for basketball. It's not like that over here. Over here, at least with girls, it seems like it's volleyball is that sport. 
And so at Castle Rock this year, we have 36 spots for girls to fill and 59 girls who want to fill those spots. So needless to say, there's a lot of work that's going on over the summer to see who's going to make the team and who's not. And the coach has a really hard job. I pray for the coach often because it's not an easy job. She's going to have to at some point make some cuts with certain players. Part of what she's doing, though, is she, she's got the girls playing with one another. And part of the reason for doing that is not only to give them the experience so that they grow, but more importantly, for them to learn how to work together. Because volleyball can't be played with one player. If you play six players against one, guess what? That one is going to lose every time. Yeah. Court's too big. And I don't care how fast you are, you're not going to get every ball. It's just the way it works. You need all six players. Each player needs to fulfill their role. Reality is, is that when it comes to discipleship, we all have a role to play as the church. We're not called to be lone rangers. We're all called to work together to help one another grow. So what does that look like? It looks like studying God's word together with other believers. We do that as we come together for the church, but we also do it during our Sunday school classes and special Bible studies. That's vitally important. Too often we miss those opportunities. But the reality is, is that we're going to grow best when we can be around other people who are learning God's word as well. The Bible says it very clearly, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. That's true for all of us. We all sharpen one another when we're together. We pray with and for other believers when we're together. Opportunities to be able to pray together. We serve side by side with one another. Opportunities to grow personally. We also make discipleship of people a high priority. And this is particularly true of discipleship to younger people. It is vitally important that a church puts a high emphasis on discipleship to young people, children and youth in particular. Especially today. It's not an easy time to be a young person. Now granted, they have cell phones. Every single one of them have cell phones. That we wouldn't even thought about. Our cell phone was just a long cord on the wall, the, the, the wall phone, right? They have all of these electronic equipment and video games and all of these little toys that we've gotten for them. Okay, So they have a lot of stuff. They have a lot of opportunity. But there are so many bad influences that are vying for their attention today. I would argue that right now there are more bad influences vying for our children's attention than ever before. And to top it all off, we live in a society that now calls evil good and good evil. Our children are in the crosshairs. And here's the sad reality. Church is making a very small impact in the lives of young people today. There's a lot of reasons for it. We could stand here and make all sorts of reasons for it, but the reality is, is that the church is increasingly making a smaller and smaller impact in the lives of young people today. Here's the reality. Most kids who come to church, even the ones who come to church, will be here for an hour, maybe two hours, maybe three hours, at the long end, four hours a week. Guess what? That's not even half a day at school. They spend a lot more time with their friends and at school than they do having anything to do with church. And that's how it's been. That's how it continues to be. So we have an increasingly smaller impact. And as more and more people have just decided, you know, church is kind of one of those things that I'll come when I feel like it. When it works out with my schedule, when it's convenient, I'll be there. Guess what? That's even less impact that we can have. And unfortunately, too often, they're not learning the truths at home that they ought to be. You know, the reality is, is this. The teacher for children are their parents. Am I a teacher for children in this church? Yes, but I am not the main teacher. The parents are. And it's our job to model what the truth of Christ is to them. What's the solution? Church has to be all in when it comes to children and youth. Church has to be all in when it comes to children or youth. 
or deal with the consequences of not being all in. This means that everyone in the church must see it as our responsibility to be part of praying for our young people, reaching out to families, welcoming families when they come in, even when their kids make noise. I had somebody say, I'm so sorry that our, that our child is making noise in the back. I don't care. Yes, that's true. Make more noise. You know why? Because I've been in churches that don't have any noise of children because there's no children. I'd rather, I'd rather talk louder, and i got a big voice. <laughs> I'd rather just talk louder and have children here. Amen? Amen. Participate in outreach opportunities where we can reach out to families. Support ministries as we're trying to reach out to children. This morning we're baptizing a young lady who most of you know. It's Zoe. You've known her for many years. Zoe came to me probably about nine months ago, and said, Pastor Ben, I want to be baptized. I said, well, let's start meeting. And so Zoe and I started meeting, and the reality is, she wasn't ready. We talked about what it was to follow Jesus, we talked about what it was to be baptized, what baptism meant, and she just wasn't ready. And so her and I continued to meet, continued to pray together, continued to, to, to work through it. Over the last number of, of about a month and a half, Zoe started to understand it better. To get it better. To be able to answer the questions. Now, does that mean that theologically she's going to be ready to write a theological treatise? No. Does it mean that she's going to, to have it all figured out? No. Does it mean that she's going to make mistakes sometimes? Yes. But as her and I have talked and prayed together, we said, yeah, it's ready. You're ready to take that step of faith. But you know, the reality is, is that she needs something from the church. And that's the reason why we baptize publicly. It's a public proclamation, but not just to say, hey, look at me, I'm getting baptized, woohoo! That's not the reason for it. And so the church recognizes that we have a responsibility. We need to encourage her. We need to guide her. We need to give her wise advice. We need, she needs to know that there are people here that love her. People who will model Christian living for her. And that she has the continual knowledge that she's in a place where she's valued. Even when she makes mistakes, because she's going to make mistakes. That she's valued and that she's loved. And she has people who want to care for her and help guide her on the pathway. That's our job. That's our responsibility as a church. Say, well, I don't work with youth. Great, fine, don't work with youth, but you can still minister to Zoe. And all the other youth in the, family, the church also. <laughs> Reality is, is that not everybody's going to be a youth leader. But everybody can minister to children and youth in this church. What's unique about a church our size is that we can give special attention to individuals if we'll just take the time to do so. But we have to take the time. See, within this passage, we should see a call for the church to invest our time, our talents, and our treasures into discipling people. And I want to specifically focus here on children and youth. We might not all be teachers. We're certainly not all youth leaders. But we can all be part of the lives of these young people that are here right now and those that will come in the future. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. How many of us would like to see twice as many kids at the children's sermon next year at this time as we saw this morning. Yeah. That doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen by accident. We need to pray for it. We need to invest in it. We need to sacrifice for it. And we need to be willing to go the extra mile for it. So the question that I leave you with this morning is this. Will you go the extra mile? Let us pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you for your grace and your goodness. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to do VBS, to, to lead these children. And Lord, I just pray that indeed we would, uh, over this next year, have even more impact into the lives of young people. And Lord, that we would see next year that we would have twice as many kids up here for our children's sermons as we had this morning, which was great to see all the children here. But Lord, I just pray that you would just continue to bless and that we would recognize that we need to invest our lives into the families in our community. They need to matter to us. 
Lord, I pray that we would move away from the idea that if we just put a church on a corner, people will show up. And that we would understand that we need to go. That you've called us to go and that we need to go to where people are at. That we need to develop relationships. That we need to show people that they are loved and valued so that we can have others that would come just like Zoe comes this morning to be baptized. We thank you for your grace and your goodness. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.